All right, mathematicians, let's get started with section 4.3, all about rotation. All right, since your question, how can you rotate a figure in a coordinate plane? Our objectives, mathematicians will be able to perform rotations, perform compositions with rotations, and identify rotational symmetry. All right, let's get some vocabulary understood and written down in our notes. So when you're performing rotations, key point number one about rotations are that they're a transformation in which a figure is turned about a fixed point. That point is the center of rotation. And then our angle of rotation is where the two rays drawn from the center of rotation to a point and its image. Here we can see an illustration of our new vocabulary words. Here's the point P, which is acting as the center of rotation. The figure that we're going to rotate, so the pre-image, is our blue image, RQ. And we're going to rotate it 40 degrees counterclockwise. Counterclockwise is when you go against the natural reading of a clock. Clockwise goes with the reading and direction of the reading of the clock. And then go against would be counterclockwise. So when I rotate about this fixed point, the center of rotation, I can draw a line, or sorry, a ray from the point of rotation, and that's acting as the angle of rotation. So we also have um, to assume that we're talking about counterclockwise, so it's our default, unless told otherwise. All right, let's get familiar with key point number two, the coordinate rules for reflections. So we've got some rotation counterclockwise. You will need some graph paper to kind of help you with um, various examples and just attach it to uh, pages 139 and 141. All right, so when we're rotating counterclockwise by a certain number of degrees, we've got 90 degrees uh, increments. So we've got 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, and then a full circle is 360 degrees. So our rule for 90 degrees, so we take our two values uh, within the coordinate, switch, and then we have opposite of that B value. So let's take a look at an example, 3, 1, same example we used in the previous notes. So our image would map to negative 1, comma 3. So the implied that helps us remember this is pre-image AB rotates 90 degrees implies the image negative B A. For a 180 degree rotation, we keep the values in the same place, but we want opposite of the two values. So let's take our example 3, 1, and we would have opposite, so negative 3, negative 1. Our implied, the pre-image AB rotates 180 degrees, implies image opposite A, opposite B. All right, if we rotate 270 degrees, we'll switch, but this time we'll have opposite of A, and B does not change. So let's take a look at our example, 3, 1. It would map onto 1, comma, negative 3. So our implied, pre-image AB rotates 270 degrees, Im implies image B, comma negative A. And then a 360 degree rotation is going to map onto itself. So no changes occur. All right, let's take a look at example two where we can rotate the figure in the coordinate plane. So grab that graph paper, take a moment, pause here, and graph quadrilateral RSTU with the following vertices. All right, so if we're going to rotate this image 270 degrees about the origin, so when we say those words about some point, that's representing the point of rotation. So the origin is our point of rotation. So we can identify that at 0, 0. All right, so just based on the previous information, the rules, we know that a rotation of 270 degrees is going to map onto switching the values and then opposite of the A value. So let's take all of our points and let's see how we can 
see what they would result in with this rule. So R would become 1 comma negative 3. S would become 1 negative 5. T would become negative 3 negative 5. And U would become negative 1 negative 2. So if we were to graph that, we would result with the following images if we're comparing. Now one thing to note with rotation is when it's about a figure, you can connect with a line towards that point of rotation and pick any vertices to check this with. So I'm going to choose U. See what happens when you connect to the point of origin, creating that angle of rotation. How many degrees does that appear to be? Well, it looks like a 90 degree angle. So that's something to note and be aware of and check to see if that works for all sets of vertices. That angle of rotation 90 degrees is exactly the increments that we are rotating about the center point of rotation. So that's definitely going to be a strategy we can try if we don't remember our rules. All right, let's move on to key point number three, our ro rotation postulate, which is a rigid motion, in other words, isometry. So, so far, every one of our transformations have been examples of rigid motion, in other words, isometry. So, we have our implied statement, rotation implies rigid motion, in other words, isometry. Now, because a rotation is a rigid motion, this means it preserves length and angle measures. So what can we conclude about the following lengths and angle measures of the figure we have here? We can conclude the exact same information that we have concluded in the previous two transformations. All the segment lengths maintain length as it rotates, and angle measures maintain as it rotates. All right, let's take a look at a composition. So we're going to graph segment RS with the following endpoints and its image after the composition. So remember, the important thing about composition is that the order in which you see them listed um, is the order in which you perform the transformation. So first, we see that we have a reflection. And we're going to reflect in the y-axis. Sorry, in the y-axis. And then we're going to rotate. After we get the resulting figure, we're going to rotate that resulting figure, which should be our first prime figure. We're going to rotate the prime figure 90 degrees about the origin. So take a minute or moment to first plot your pre-image. So I'm going to start by only revealing the part of the graph that should contain the pre-image. So here we have our pre-image R to S. Our first item of business is to rotate, uh, sorry, reflect it in the y-axis. So let's take a quick check. Our reflection line is our y-axis. So I should be equal distance on each side of this reflection line. So I can see that point R is one unit away from the reflection line. So my R prime should be one unit on the opposite side of the reflection line. S is two units away, so I should be two units on the opposite side. So let's check. This is, should be our resulting figure for R prime to S prime. And since I'm now going to rotate it 90 degrees about the origin, I can connect. So I've drawn a line segment connecting point R to the point of origin. And then I want to form a 90 degree angle. So my resulting line should be going 90 degrees this way and I can see it should result with R prime in this location at 3 negative 1. So here's a 90 degree angle. Remember 90 degrees or perpendicular lines have opposite reciprocal slopes. Let's check that real quick. From here I have up 1, 2, 3 over 1. So it has a slope of positive 3. That means this other slope line, part of my angle, the ray, should have a negative one-third slope. So let's see. If I go down one and right three, I land at where I should be for R double prime. And then I can go down one over three to land for S uh, double prime. 
So this is the result after the composition. 3, negative 1 for R prime, double prime, and then 6, negative 2 for S double prime. If you need to pause the video here to read through the steps for yourself and do a recount of your steps, take a moment to do that. All right, our final key point for rotations is identifying rotational symmetry. Rotational symmetry is when a figure can be mapped onto itself by a rotation of 180 degrees or less about the center of the figure. And then that point of rotation is known as our center of symmetry. So let's just take this example, a regular octagon. Remember, regular means all sides are equal and all angle measures are the same. So a regular octagon has eight sides. Therefore, it has eight rotational symmetries. So I can see that I can rotate it once and it's mapped onto itself. If I rotate it twice, it's mapped onto itself and thrice and then four times and so a total of eight rotations. So if I take 360 degrees and divide that by the eight rotations, that results in a 45 degree rotation of symmetry. So every 45 degrees, it will map onto itself. All right, so let's identify rotational symmetry. Does the figures below have rotational symmetry? If so, describe any rotations that map the figure onto itself. All right, so looking at parallelogram, does it map onto itself when you rotate it around? Yeah, for sure. It can definitely rotate at least once onto um, a 180 degree rotation. How about the trapezoid? Trapezoid, as you rotate it, unfortunately it has to go a full 360 degrees for it to rotate back onto itself. So only the parallelogram has rotational symmetry and the trapezoid does not. All right, let's distinguish between types of symmetry. So at this point, we've now learned about a second type of symmetry. The first type was line symmetry in our previous lesson. So let's take a look at this figure and see if we can identify any line symmetry and rotational symmetry that an equilateral triangle has. We see by the markings that an equilateral triangle means that all sides are the same length and all angle measures are the same measure. So does an equilateral have line symmetry? For sure, we can get at least three lines. And actually, it's only three. So let's see, we have one, two, three lines of symmetry. And then as far as rotation symmetry, looks like it has 120 degrees. And that's figured by 360 divided by three, which equals 120 degree rotational symmetry. So an equilateral has both line and rotational symmetry. All right, that's all for rotations, and just bring your clarifying questions into class tomorrow. And I leave you with this from Optimus Prime.